La emisión está comenzando. Todos los asistentes están en modo de solo escucha. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you are all doing well and that you have a great summer holiday. And thank you so much for, for joining us. So uh, today we have the, the second session of the 2021 Alter Student Webinar Series that will take place in, in the next few weeks. And uh, first of all, if you have any problem with uh, your audio, please uh, try to switch from computer audio to a phone call. And before starting with, with the demos, uh, let me present myself. I'm Laura Rosso and I studied both my, my engineers and my master's degree in industrial engineering at the University Carlos III of Madrid. And I'm working at Alter Spain since uh, February 2020, so just a few weeks before the, the pandemic started in, in Spain. And I work as an academic liaison and business development representative working uh, both on universities and industry. So I'll be hosting uh, today's um, webinar and here you can see the, the agenda with uh, three presentations that we have prepared for you. The first one is for Alter Inspire at 10 a.m., where we will learn how to do a lightweight design. After that, uh, we have the presentation of Alter Inspire Studio at 11 a.m. to see how to do a CAD design and then rendering it. And the final presentation is about Alter SimLab from 12 to 12.40, uh, more or less. Uh, where we will show you how to simulate a multiphysic uh, phenomenon. Um, after each session, we will have a couple of minutes to, to answer all your questions. So you can use the, the question tab that uh, you will find at the bottom of uh, the GoToWebinar page. Do ask uh, the speakers all your jobs and we will answer all of them when when the demos have finished or by email if we don't have uh, enough time to answer them. So two important things that uh, you all should know before today's presentations are what simulation driven design is and why uh, we all should in implement it. So before simulation driven design uh, in the, the classic development approach, a lot of time was, was needed to create a, a new design as there were many, many iterations to, to do before obtaining the, the, the correct design. Uh, so we had to do so many analysis and, until you had the, the proper results. So what has uh, simulation driven design changed? Well, uh, mainly it has changed the, the, the whole product development by uh, reducing design iterations and uh, the prototype testing. So it has to be used in, in, in the early design process. So this uh, let us uh, save time and gain performance compared to the, the traditional approach. So for you as, as engineers or, or future engineers, you know how important this is <laughs> because uh, saving time mainly means saving money. And if you save time while you gain performance, well, I can think of, uh, of a better duo. So uh, the first uh, uh, of our presentations is presented by Connor uh, Smith and Marco Armelin, who are both mechanical engineer graduates from University of Bath and who are specializing in the design of uh, outboard suspension components of the Bath racing team. Okay, so Connor is going to, to explain a little about Formula Student Competition and the team itself. And before speaking about the, the suspension design and the role of topology optimization. And after that, Marco is going to, to do a demonstration of an optimization for a lightweight design with Alter Inspire, where you can create and, and modify designs uh, easily, optimize for manufacturability, and simulate at the speed of, of design. Um, as you will see, Alter Inspire is uh, really easy to use and very intuitive, which will allow you to, to have uh, results really, really fast. 
So uh, we're going to start with uh, the team based uh, racing. Hello, my name is Connor Smith. I'm the outboard suspension designer for the Team Bath Racing former student team based at the University of Bath. I'm going to be speaking today about gaining a competitive advantage with rapid design exploration technologies. But first, what actually is Formula Student? So Formula Student is an international motorsport engineering competition where teams from around the world design, build and then compete a single seater open wheel Formula style race car. As you can see, there's a huge number of teams around the world competing at over 15 competitions on five different continents. The way every competition works is there are a thousand points available and these are split up into a variety of events. The first is the dynamic events. So these consist of, consist of acceleration, which is a straight line acceleration event. Skid pads, which is a figure of eight, where the car's steady state handling ability is pushed to the limits. Then sprint, which is a single lap of a short twisty track, really pushing the car's handling to the limits. Then is endurance, which is the uh, standout event of every competition. This is a 20 kilometer event on a track very similar to the sprint course, pushing both the car's performance, the driver's endurance, and also the car's reliability to the limits. Finally, efficiency, where the amount of either fuel or electric energy the car uses during the endurance event is judged and ranked. The second set of events are known as the static events. These are made up of design where both not both not just the design of your car is judged, but also your engineering understanding and your engineering decision making behind all of your decisions are judged. Cost, where you have to present full costings of your car. And for reference, we go down to the cost of individual nuts, bolts, adhesives. It goes to the complete bare roots of manufacturing the car. And finally, business, where we present a business case for taking this prototype race car into a sustainable business model. And now a little bit about Team Bath Racing. So we were founded in the year 2000, make us one of the oldest UK teams based at the University of Bath. We're typically made up of around 25 final year master students, all studying mechanical engineering. Some of our highlights include winning former student check in 2016, and we were the first UK team to ever win a former student event outright. Third in the very competitive Formula Student Austria in 2018, and most recently winning a virtual Formula Student UK in 2020. Now, what sets Team Bath Racing apart from a lot of other Formula Student teams, both in the UK and abroad, is that we have what we call a blank sheet design philosophy every year. And what that means is every single year we start from scratch. We, re we look to redesign and improve and remake every single part of the car. And really, we try to never carry over anything from the previous year's car. Now, what this means is not only do we develop the car very quickly because we're always improving every single area of the car, but also we get a much better understanding of all the engineering decisions and the engineering processes that go into designing every single part of the car. And that means we're able to progress from the car you see on the left of the screen, which we made in 2001, all the way to our latest car 20 years later in 2021. So a little bit about this car. This is called TBR21. It's our latest car. We're competing this at Silverstone at the end of July this summer. A few of the highlights are it's a full carbon fiber reinforced monocoque chassis, very similar to what is used in Formula One and other motorsport series. We run a KTM 500 motorbike engine. However, we add our own turbocharger to this and run it on E85 fuel. And that means we produce 72 brake horsepower and around 66 newton meters of torque. The car itself weighs 170 kilos with all its fluids and petrol on board. And what that means is with a power to weight ratio of in between a Ferrari 458 and a Bugatti Veyron. So you get an idea on the performance figures we're talking about. We run a full aerodynamics package, a front wing, a rear wing, a floor, a diffuser, a pneumatic paddle shift gear chain shift system using paddles on the steering wheel and carbon fiber suspension. And now we also run topology optimized suspension uprights, which we're going to talk about in detail for the rest of this presentation. Before we do that, just a little aside on suspension design. So the main targets you have when designing the suspension system of your car is to have low unsprung mass. 
Unsprung mass is anything, any part of the vehicle that's directly in contact with the track and isn't supported by the vehicle springs. So that would be the tyre, the wheel, um, your upright, your brakes, your wishbones, all of that. And the reason you want to make this as low as possible is if you model the car as this spring mass damper system you see on the bottom left of the screen, if you imagine the unsprung mass of the car was very high, if the car and the tyre went over a bump, it would take much longer for that tyre to return to the track if it was heavier. And what that means is you get uh, reduced grip during that period and also much more unsteady uh, feel in the car, which affects the driver and the overall handling ability of the car. Second is reliability. Obviously, the entire suspension system is a very critical part of the car. A failure in pretty much any single component within that system would be catastrophic. As you can see on the image there, that was a failure of a single one single component within the suspension system, and that was the aftermath. Finally, our final aim was to minimise the compliance of the car. Compliance is another word for deflection within the suspension system. And you can see here another team's race car is going around a corner and the rear left tyre you can see is bending outwards much more than the other tyres are. Now what this does is it's going to affect the grip that the tyre that that tyre is producing and as you go around the corner that's going to vary which again is going to both reduce the handling the overall handling capability of the car but also the way it feels to the driver as they're going around a bend which really reduces their confidence in the car. So those are our main aims for suspension design. You want to make it as light as possible, as stiff as possible for compliance, and also make it reliable. It cannot fail at all. So now onto uprights. So the upright part is the, uh, the light gray part that's indicated by the green arrow on the screen. And this is a really central part of the suspension system. So just to explain the image to you, on the very left, the carbon fiber uh, large part filling the screen, that's the chassis of the car. And then over on the right, that would be the wheel hub, where the uh, the wheel is normally sat and would hide all of the uh, the upright and the rest of the components in that part of the image. So the upright connects the wheel hub, as I said, all the way to the chassis, transferring loads along wishbones, which are these uh, grey carbon fibre rods you can see. It also holds the brake caliper uh, just behind the image that you can see. So what this means is the upright is a really central part of the car, and it has very high load cases because throughout the entire cornering of the car, either if it's going around a left hand or a right hand corner, if we're braking, if we're accelerating, if we're hitting bumps or doing any combination of these, it's taking all of the loads from the track and putting them into the chassis. Now that means, as I said, we've got very large, very complex load cases that are varying throughout a, tra throughout a lap of a track, which means it's a very large reliability risk to assess and account for all of these. It's also a very large part, as you can see, as compared to the rest of the components within the suspension system, it's probably the largest part. This means it has a large, it makes up a large proportion of the mass of the assembly, which gives us a large risk of increasing our unsprung mass in the design of the part. Finally, as I said, it's the central part of the assembly, which means if this part isn't stiff enough, if we have too much compliance within the upright, then we'll see large amounts of compliance amplified throughout the entire assembly. So what this means is the upright is a really critical part that we have to get the design for both strength, for stiffness and weight really spot on to maximise our handling performance. So how did we approach this problem? Well, first of all, we topology optimised the shape of our uprights using Altair Inspire. We then additively manufactured them from a high strength aluminium scandium alloy with our partners at Progressive Technology. And then new for this year, we made the uprights feet with a solid outer shell of material. And then inside of the uprights are hollow, and we filled those with a lattice structure, which is sort of a diagonal, very small uh, diagonal scaffold structure to connect all of the outer shell of the part together. And you can see a few of the images of the front and rear uprights on the screen below you. And in the right-hand image, you can see um, some portions of the lattice structure that are exposed, uh, just so you can see up close what that looks like. So, what is topology optimization and why do we use this in the design of our uprights? So the main reason we use topology optimization is, as I said earlier, with very complex low cases into this component. And it's quite tricky as a design engineer to look at that and say, well, what form should the upright take to meet those low cases? 
So the way that this works is first of all, you define functional part surfaces. Now for the upright, these are things like the bearing seats, bolt pickup points where wishbones connect. You can see in the bottom left of the screen, that's what that would look like. These are surfaces that you must have for the part to perform and fulfill the role that you need it to. You then model what's known as a design space. Design space is an area where no other parts such as the wishbones or the brake caliper or the wheel rim exist and where the topology optimization software is allowed to place material without it causing problems for you in terms of clashing. You then import all of this into Altair Inspire and just like any other FEA software, you can add low cases, so adding forces, bearing loads, constraints, just like you can see in the image below. You can then topology optimize this and what you're doing there is you're setting the software target. So in this case, we set it to maximize the stiffness of the component for all of the inputted load cases whilst meeting a specified mass of the part. And what you can see is it's taken the entirety of the design space and it's distilled that down just into the areas it wants the material to be, to be the most uh, useful to maximize the stiffness of the part. You can then refine this using built-in FEA software within Inspire, and then I remodeled that in, uh, in CAD to give a finished refined part for a nice refinement loop, just to keep tweaking and altering things as we went along. And now, just for, uh, just for interest, as I mentioned earlier, the uprights actually also contained a internal lattice structure. I just wanted to give you a bit of a background in how we designed with lattices in Inspire. So first of all, you can perform FEA on just a small piece of a lattice structure uh, with an outer shell. And you can use the, the deflection and force values from that FEA to estimate the stiffness of the lattice structure. The reason you do that on a very small piece of lattice is because, as you can see, the lattice is very computationally heavy to perform traditional FEA on. And if you try to FEA an entire part made up of that lattice structure, it would take a much more powerful computer than I own to do that and probably more, much more time than I had available to me. So with that, you have a stiffness, a Young's modulus for your lattice structure. You can then go into Inspire and you can create a custom material with that stiffness. You can then run the topology optimization like I explained on the slide before, out of which you get, the, uh, you get a form such as on the, the image on the bottom right of the screen. So that's the direct output from Inspire. And then you can see on the very right-hand side of the screen, the finished upright component that's using the exact same lattice structure and past extra stages of FEA after that. And you can see that the two results are very similar to each other, which means we can use Inspire with quite a good amount of confidence to guide us in the form that a component should take while containing this lattice structure. You can also directly optimize the density of lattice structures within Inspire, and you can produce, therefore, parts that look quite similar to uh, this electric motor casing that Porsche have recently developed and publicized. So a little bit more about Altair Inspire itself and why that I selected Inspire and why we at Team Buff Racing continue to use it for our projects. So the first is the user interface. As you can see on the screen, it's very clear. It's very well set out with graphical buttons that are very obvious what they mean and how they work. And also with a very nice, clear model browser on the left-hand side of the screen where you can very easily see all the different solid bodies and topology optimizations and load cases you've input. Now, what this means is it's very easy to pick up and learn and use very quickly without having to go through a very detailed course or uh, instruction or be a very expert uh, FEA engineer in this software, which is really handy if you're just using this to try and pick up. You're designing a part as a design engineer and you just want a really quick guide on what the form of your part should be. Secondly, the ease of simulation setup. Again, it's very standard, sort of very familiar FEA to most design engineers. We're not going into the really expert level FEA softwares where you need to be a structure analysis engineer to ever really make sense or even understand how to use the software or perform an accurate analysis. Third, you can perform FEA on the resultant topology optimized part directly in the software. And this is very much quicker than uh, a lot of other softwares I found the way the FEA is performed. Uh, now, what this means is that you can perform very rapid design iterations. You can perform a topology optimization run, maybe setting a target mass of 
500 grams you could then fea that and see actually no this part is still a little bit overly strong a little bit too heavy for my liking and you can go straight back you can close your analysis and in the same window you can rerun your topology optimization say targeting a mass of 400 grams and then you can fea that and see if you're closer to your design targets Finally, it's just really quick. It's a really quick, easy way of getting a good guide and a good um, a good guidance on what shape your part should take. So not only are we using it for really complex components such as upfights with really varied uh, low cases and large amounts of uh, pickup points and areas that have to be optimized, but we also use it for uh, images for parts such as in the image on the top right of the screen, which is our suspension rocker for our spring so that transfers the loads from the push rod of the car into our spring damper unit that you can see there and we used Altair Inspire for this just to give us a good idea on the shape of the component where we want the extra webs of material just a simple 2d analysis which again really quick to do and saved us a lot of time of going through a traditional CAD and FEA iteration loop so now on some results so on the here you can see a machined upright for the TBR car that we use in testing just to limit the fatigue, uh, the fatigue life exposure of our additively manufactured part. This weighs 750 grams and it's designed to have the same performance characteristics as our proper topology optimized additively manufactured upright, which you can see is almost 300 grams lighter than the uh, than the machine part, which is almost 50% lighter. So a really big saving for such a central key part of our suspension system using Inspire. So a quick summary, using topology optimization to design our uprights produce uh, over 40% mass saving on the TBR21 car. Using Altair Inspire allows for very rapid design iterations of component form with varied low cases, varied materials in different inputs. We've also identified a strategy to combine both topology optimization and lattice structures, which are the two main uh, most common ways of using additive manufacture to reduce the weight of components. And Fire and Altai Inspire continue to be a key design tool for the entire for a large amount of components on the Team Bath Racing car. And I know that we're already using Inspire to design parts for our future cars. So thank you very much for listening. So thank you so much, uh, Connor. Now uh, we will see the uh, Inspire demo. So let's go. Hi, everyone. On today's video, we're going to be having a look at Altair Inspire 2020.1, where we're going to be performing an analysis and an optimization of an aircraft door support fitting. So let's begin. Uh, to bring in the file, we can either use open or go to File, Import, locate to the directory where you've saved the file and press Open. So here it is. Now just a couple of controls for you. So to rotate the model is to um, middle click on the mouse. So using the scroll, click in the scroll button or uh, to pan, we can right click on the mouse and to uh, zoom in and out is obviously just the scroll button. So. Now that's done, uh, let's go ahead and assign some material properties. So there's a couple of ways in which we can do this. Um, we can do it through the property editor or interactively on screen. So if you haven't got the model browser or the property editor showing, you can go into view and choose model browser and property editor from here. So if we left click on the part, we can see that in the property editor, we have things like um, some general properties like the name of the part, the material. Um, we have also some um, meshing controls within here that you can choose, motion controls, etc. Um, but at the moment we'll just focus on changing the material. So we can either do it within here, or if we right click on the part itself and go to material and aluminium 2024, we'll select that and just left click somewhere else on screen and that's it done. And we can even press this button here to calculate the mass of the part. Another thing uh, that we could do is actually bring in our own material properties if you happen to have them. So we have this in the structures ribbon, we have the materials tab. 
So you can see there are a couple of materials in here. We can obviously delete them using this button. And to introduce a new one, we just press the plus. We can change the name, put in the Young's Modulus, Poisson's Ratio, etc. to create a host of uh, material properties. Uh, basically, you can create your own material database. Uh, save it, share it around, and open it up so that you only need to create this material database once. But for today, we'll stick with Aluminium 2024. So now that that's done, um, let's have a look at some geometry editing capabilities. So within Inspire, um, more often than not, you may bring in your CAD and, and the CAD will be fine. But if you do want to make really, really quick design changes and reanalyze them really quickly, uh, we can do that using the geometry editing tools in here. So we'll just for the moment um, create something simple like a rectangle by center. So we can click on that and then choose the plane which we want to draw on. So let's just say this top plane for the moment and we'll create a new part and we can also snap normal to the grid and then just left click and drag to form, form the rectangle. So we can right click and swipe to confirm that sketch and then right click and swipe to confirm that again and it's now created a surface for us. Um, what it's also done is to activate the sort of extrude tool that we have called um, push pull um, so this is already active and we can select this here and just by left clicking and dragging we can choose how high we want to drag it and obviously we can equally put it in the height so let's say we go 0.04 for example. Um, so yeah that's pretty interactive to, to create that part. Um, one thing you notice is we're in meters obviously if you want to change that you can go to the bottom right hand corner and just choose whatever unit system you would like to work in. So that's just a quick demonstration of some of the things that we can do. Obviously, we don't really want this. So what we can do is left click on the part and just press delete. So that's just some of the sketching functionalities. Another nice tool is um, if you notice that there are any dodgy surfaces around in the model, you could go ahead and delete them and then repatch them within here. So for example, if I go on the patch tool, I can patch this surface. So click once to sort of um, initiate the action and then click again to patch that surface. So you can see that we've closed off that side. Um, we can actually delete the surfaces too with this tool. So you can see that we have this X next to the mouse. So if I just click on that again, that'll get rid of it. So left clicking to come out of the patch tool, we can now have a look at some of the tools in the modify section. So without having to create a sketch, we can edit the geometry that we already have. So for example, using the push pull tool, we can say uh, increase the width of this so we can just left click and drag interactively you'll notice that it snaps so if it does if you press alt on your keyboard that will disable the snaps if you realize that you've made a, made a mistake you can always just control z um, to revert back to the original design other things that we can do for example if you realize that there's a um, bolt hole in the wrong place for example we can left click and we can just interactively click and drag and move the holes into their correct position. So again, we'll control Z out of that one. Uh, another nice little tool is the mirror function. So we can mirror this part, let's say around this plane, and we can keep the original and we can instance it as well. So when we instance it and we perform some geome geometric changes on the original part, we can go to push pull, say I click on this face, and if I hold down alt again, you'll see that both parts will have that change um, added automatically. So that's another really way to get a really quick way to get through some design changes rapidly. So we'll um, edit undo through that as we only want to consider the one part. And within here as well, we have Boolean tools when you have uh, more than one part, cutting tools where we can easily just um, assign a cut plane throughout the part and split it into two. And then again, we can go into Boolean and combine the two again, just to show how this works. Uh, you can see that it's left an imprint. So we have some simplifying tools where we have an imprint itself. So it's noticed those imprints that we've just created and we can go ahead and just remove them. And again, we have tools for um, removing rounds, removing holes and a plug tool. So holes and plug are, are pretty similar. So uh, a hole will, well, it will find the hole and it will just simply um, remove everything within there. So this is something that we'll do for the optimization in a bit. And that will sort of fill the hole and Boolean everything together. Whereas if we were to plug it, um, we can double click on this, it finds everything adjacent. 
and it creates a separate part as a plug. So they do the same thing, just plug will not boolean the parts together. Other things that we'll do for the optimization is we can partition areas. So for the optimization, we'll need to come up with some design spaces and areas which the optimizer can't touch, and that we'll do with the partition tool. And finally, we have mid-surfacing and um, creating fillets and chamfers. Another nice thing that we can have a look at is, so obviously we can cycle through the uh, ribbons at the top, so everything's in sort of a left to right workflow. But another thing that we can do is we can access the tool belt. So if you press Alt and right click, you'll bring up this tool belt and that will access, will give you access to a lot of the tools just from this one click. So you don't have to jump between ribbons. And we have, so just Alt will bring up this set of um, tools. So a lot of the geometry editing is within here, plus some structural analysis um, boundary conditions. If we press Control, we get more of the Inspire Motion side of things. If we press, so that's Alt and Control. If we do Alt and Shift, um, we get more of the structural analysis side and we can do Alt, Shift and Control and that'll give you some polynerves functions. So there's two ways you can access the tools, either using the tool belt, which is Alt and right click and then a combination of Alt, Control and Shift, or we can just use the ribbons. So now that we've done that, let's go ahead and start the analysis. So Bearing in mind here that we're going to do an optimization, we're going to actually partition the part before we run the analysis. So we'll go to the partition tool. It notifies areas where it thinks to put in a partition, but we're going to manually create them ourselves. So we can zoom in and we can click on, you can see it's highlighted this cylinder. So we can left click on it once to highlight the area which we wish to partition and then left click on it again and it will create our partition of 3 mil. Now we're going to do the same, so left click, then left click again around these uh, bottom six fixings. So we'll repeat that. And then we'll do one for uh, where we're going to apply the force. But actually this is going to be 5 mil, so we can just type in 0 0.005, hit enter, and that's the partitions created. And you'll see, once we right click and swipe out of here, you can see that it's created these different partitions in the model browser. They'll they'll have the same material properties too, so if we click on that, we can see that it's aluminium 2024. So now that we've done that, we can go ahead and start setting up the boundary conditions for the model. So we'll go ahead and go to structure. So what we can do within here is we can apply fasteners and joints automatically. So it will look for um, through holes or single holes, for example, and apply the um, FE definition to these areas. We can apply connectors and spot wells, for example, and even contacts too. So because we have um, eight odd different parts here, we can click on the contacts tool and you can see that all the parts are seen as uh, bonded together, which is fine for the analysis that we're going to run. So just a quick example again. So for fasteners, we can look for aligned holes or single holes, for example, and it can notify regions which you would like to fill. And then we can just left click and it will automatically put in something in there. Obviously, this isn't what we want to do, but that's just a brief example of how it can work. So we'll undo that and come out of there. So let's go ahead and start setting up the analysis. So I'm going to go ahead and apply some supports. So one thing you'll notice is that we actually have a multi-purpose uh, function buttons within Inspire. So within the loads tab, you'll see that we um, whatever area is highlighted in blue is the action that you're going to perform. So in this case, it's supports, but we can also do pressure, torques, forces, uh, for example. And the same is for other tools as well. So you can see in the displacement side, we have displacement constraints and we have enforced displacements. But we're looking at creating some supports. So we're going to left click on support and let's just rotate the model so we can see beneath it. Now, when it comes to applying the support, you'll notice that if you look just to the right of the mouse, you'll see um, sort of what the support is going to be applied to. So in this case, you see sort of the, the rectangle above the support. It means it's going to apply it to a face. If we move the mouse um, to an edge, you can see that the rectangles become just a line. So that's uh, an edge support. And if we move into the center of here, we can see that it's going to put in a support within the cylinder itself. So this is the one that we're looking for. So once you can see that symbol, we can left click and the support will be created. You'll also see a load case is now created too. So we'll go ahead and do this for the bottom six supports. So just left click within the cylinder. 
and those are the supports created. Another thing that we now need to do is to apply a force. So we'll change this to force and let's uh, select the center of this point here. So we'll go for value of uh, positive Y. So we can either change the direction by pressing Y so you can see this arrow switching and we can use the plus minus tool here as well. So let's say uh, 1000 Newtons, for example. So we'll right click and swipe to select that. So that's basically one load case now done. But we'd like two load cases for uh, in this case. So you can see here that in the model browser we have all the loads and displacements and then we have the one particular load case. So let's, um, we can go ahead and rename this to positive Y. And now we want to create another load case. So to do that, we can right click on positive Y and go to new load case and we'll call this um, positive Z. Now, without having to create everything again, because we have most of the parts here, what we can do is move from the all loads and displacements tab. So Inspire works in a couple of different ways. If you were to, so left click on support one and hold down shift and go to support six and left click again. If we click and drag to positive Z, it will copy and paste all the supports. But if we were to do it from positive Y, it'll actually move them. So you can see force one here just to demonstrate. If I click force one into positive Z, it will move from one load case to the other. But when we want to copy it, so if we want to copy any supports, forces, any boundary conditions, we take them from all loads and displacements. If you want to move them, make sure you move it from one load case to the other. But now we can see that the positive Z load case is written in bold, which means it's active. So anything that we create here is going to go into this load case. So let's apply another force within the center of here. Let's go to positive Z and let's make this, you know, for example, just 2000 Newtons. Okay. So in its simplest, that is the uh, boundary condition setup complete. And we can go ahead and actually run the analysis. So we'll press this play button here to run an Optistruct analysis. So Optistruct being uh, Altair's implicit FE solver. So we can change the name, so tool support, and we can chuck in an analysis as well if we want. Um, the element size, now you can override the element size if you want, but Inspire will come up with an element size that it deems suitable for the geometry that you have. So you can leave that or you can override it if you want, if you want to perform any sort of mesh sensitivity studies. Other things that we can do are normal modes analysis, buckling modes, we can choose um, speed and accuracy. So in this case, we'll just run with faster to help speed up the solve time. And again, for contacts, we can do sliding only and sliding with separation. Now, sliding with separation will take a little bit longer to solve. We can include gravity and also we can include and exclude different load cases. So from here, we can go ahead and press run. Um, one thing that you might want to do before that is um, if you go into file preferences and go into run options you can choose the number of CPU cores that you would like to use so obviously use as many as you have available so yes um, press run um, it may take a matter of two to three minutes so um, in a second I'll make some uh, results magically appear so once the analysis is run you'll see that the parts now have changed with this little contour appearing next to them. So that means that these parts have got results loaded and you should see uh, a green tick around this region here indicating the results are there. Um, to actually see the results, you can press the green tick or just click on this button here and we can have a look at some of the results. So in this case, we're just having a look at uh, displacement. Um, we can change the contour. So if we press this, legend options button here we can choose the legend colors and we can change displacement let's say to just rainbow so we'll press ok on that one and here we can see the displacement values for um, the different load cases so positive y positive z and a result envelope which is sort of the, the max of the two so we can see displacement other result types are we have factor of safety so you can see here the minimum is 10 and it goes up quite high to roughly 8,000. Um, and we can have a look at things like percent of yield, 
uh, von Mises stress, for example. And there's even a slider where we can identify the regions of highest stress. And you can see this, uh, see here that it's at the uh, front of the um, mounting regions here. Other things that we can do, say if I pop back to displacement, is we can actually uh, run the animation. So we can choose the speed. If we go to positive Y or positive Z, we can run the animation. So only available for those two instead of the result envelope. And we can change the amount of deflection. We can change the speed of the animation. Um, we can show the original shape. Uh, we can choose to show the boundary conditions, show the max deformation, and we can even hide the quantum too. One nice thing, again, when it comes to particularly comparing different different designs, is we have this min-max function. So this just plots a callout on the nodes with the uh, maximum and minimum values of the uh, of the contour that you have showing. So we can find the minimum displacement around here and the maximum on the parts as well. And if there are any points of interest within the model, we can just drop callouts anywhere across. So we have obviously the corner, but we can choose to drop one there and one at this point as well. And you can interactively see the displacement across the whole part. There's even a callout table, so you can identify all the different callouts within here uh, and see what the values are. So we'll appear out of that and we'll come out of the results too. So now that we've run the analysis, you know, for example, we could see that the factor of safety, the minimum was 10. So uh, if we're looking to optimize the part, there's a couple of things that we can do. Um, so we'll we'll look in this case um, as at a couple, so we can optimize uh, for well maximizing the stiffness or for minimizing the mass. So a way of reducing the weight of the part, but still either maintaining the deflection of the part or minimizing the def the deflection or allowing a little bit of deflection whilst reducing the amount of material of the part. So that's basically maximize stiffness and minimize mass respectively. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to actually defeature the part. So we want to, what we want to do is give the optimizer the most amount of space possible to find the optimal load paths. So the more we constrain the optimizer with the amount of material available, the more difficult it will be to find these optimal load paths. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to defeature the part. So we can go back into the geometry tab. And in this case, we're going to go to simplify and we're just going to use the holes tool. So we've already done the partitions. Um, these aren't the holes that we wish to fill. So we can press this clear button here and we'll manually go ahead and just delete the holes. So in this case, it's quite simple. So all we need to do is we have this back face here. Uh, if we double click on it, it will identify all the adjacent faces. So we double click, it's highlighted all these in red. If we left click again, it will just fill the hole. Now we can do the same on all these parts. So I'll rotate around here, double click again and cover it. And we can also square off these faces as well and we can use the hole tool to do that. So if I left click and then left click again. So if you double click it will try and highlight everything. So if you do a left click, wait a second or two, just move the mouse and left click again it will square off the part. So we'll do that here as well. So in essence, I mean this is a reasonably simple part but that's our design space created. So now that we've created the geometry of it we actually need to assign the design space and again that's quite easy. You can either do it in the property editor here or you can right click on it and click on the design space too. So now that we've done that uh, let's go ahead and set up some optimization constraints. So there's a big emphasis in Inspire in making sure that the part that you optimize um, can actually be manufactured. So um, you know, more often than not you're, you're not going to want to 3D print everything and um, that tends to be maybe a misconception of the parts that you're always going to uh, be left with after an optimization, and obviously that's particularly difficult to do. Um, so what we have within here is we have a set of um, shape controls whereby we can set mirror planes or symmetric controls and some draw directions, for example. So depending on the manufacturing technique, we can put a single draw, split draw, extrusion, and even overhang constraints if you are to 3D print the part. In this case, we're just going to apply a symmetric control. So we're going to click on the part here, and as all planes are highlighted in red, um, we just want to keep the one in the ZX plane. So we can left click on this plane, left click on this plane, and that will deselect it. So we're left with just plane two here. 
So now that that's been assigned, we can go ahead and run the optimization. So let's have a look at what we have within here. So we can rename it. So in this case, you, it could be um, maximize stiffness, or you can call it minimize mass, whatever it may be. Um, we have several different types. So we have topology optimization, topography, gauge, topography and gauge, lattice, and even polynub shape. But today we'll just focus on topology uh, with two different objectives. So we've got maximize stiffness that we're going to have a look at results for and to minimize mass. There is also maximize frequency in there. So for maximize stiffness, you can see that we can set some mass targets. So we'll look at keeping sort of 30% of the total design space volume. Or if we were to look at minimizing mass, whereby we're likely to remove obviously more material, but that's going to lead to a greater deflection, we can set a stress constraint as a minimum safety factor. So in this case, we'll have a look at one for 1.5. We can set frequency constraints within the model. We can set thickness constraints. So we don't want uh, members to appear uh, particularly thin as it's likely to lead to failure. So we can set a minimum constraint on that. Again, same with faster and more accurate. So we'll stay with faster. You'll only really use more accurate when you're sort of at a validation stage. And again, same with contacts. We'll keep that as sliding only. So we'll go ahead and run that. This will take a little bit longer, say maybe 10 odd minutes. So in a sec, um, we'll go ahead and have a look at some optimization results. Once we run the optimization, we should come to a screen that looks something like uh, what we have here with the Shape Explorer shown. So typically when it comes to running a minimized mass, the more optimal shape tends to be towards the right hand side of the slider. So we tend to have to add some material. So the slider should appear around this range and we can obviously start to reduce material, but we can see that um, the structures are now disconnected. Or if we move to the right, we'll start adding material and just again, having having a look by eye, you can see that some of the members are looking a little bit thin. So we can just move this to the right a little bit as well. And now we can see we've got a more complete structure here. So what we've actually done is we've run an optimization for maximizing stiffness and for minimizing mass. So we can have a look at the maximize stiffness run and you can see that the results are very, very different. And obviously they're likely to weigh very different as well. So again, here we can perform the same thing in adding or removing material. For a maximized stiffness run, the best result tends to be around the middle anyway. But again, if we move the slider, we can see that we can remove material and then land on a value that we think looks acceptable. So focusing on the minimized mass, what we'll do is we'll actually from here is we will reanalyze the part. So we've run the optimization. It's provided us this, um, this shape here. Um, but really what we want to do is actually confirm that the performance is indeed better. So if we sort of calculate the weight of the part, we can see that it's sort of 0 0.08 kilos. Whereas if we switch to the original part, it was 2.8. So obviously we, we've lost quite a lot of mass. So let's reanalyze. So just by pressing that button, we can uh, continue the reanalysis. So um, we'll let Opdestruct take over again. And then in a second, we'll be able to have a look at some of the results. So once the analysis or the reanalysis is complete, um, we can have a look at the results. So we'll just press this green tick up here to have a look at the results. So we get the same for the two different load cases and we'll have the result envelope in there. So we can play the animation check the uh, displacement again. So we have the same contours as before. So we can look at things like a factor of safety and we can see the minimum here is uh, one. And again, we can identify the regions of lower uh, factor of safety using the slider as well. And again, we can query the same, um, same uh, result types as before. So what we will do again is we'll plot a, a minimum and maximum value. So we see the minimum of zero and a maximum of again, um, 6e to the minus 4 meters, so still very small displacement indeed. Um, and the nice thing that we can do is actually we can go ahead and, and compare some results. So if we press the compare results button, what this will bring up is a table of uh, results for both the original analyzed part and the optimizations. So for example, if you can see in this table here, we can see a, a result envelope value, the positive y and z load cases, and you can see here that the Maximum displacement is obviously a lot smaller for the part that has a lot more material to it. Um, but you can see that the mass has dropped from 
uh, almost one and a half kilos to well a tenth of that size. What we can do as well is we can bring in um, some more contours within here so we can plot obviously displacement minimum and maximum we can put in a factor of safety so let's say minimum factor of safety obviously you can see that it's a lot higher for the part with more material but as expected because we've done a, um, a minimized mass run so you're going to have um, more deflection within your part here and we can do the same for all these different outputs so this is just a really quick way to compare the um, your design before the optimization and after and obviously based on the criteria that you set um, you can see if this is uh, acceptable or not and you can do the same for the um, optimization for max stiffness just by um, performing a reanalysis on the optimization for max stiffness so if we we come out of this um, we can change this with the radio button here to optimization for max stiffness and you can go back into the optimize tool here and press well, if we go move that to the center again and press analyze and then we'll be able to compare all the parts so you can really sort of dig into a, a generative design process by trying all these different designs different optimizations and seeing which one suits your purpose the best so now that we've done that actually so we've compared we've confirmed the results and, and we're happy with the performance of the part um, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, actually create something that we can bring back into CAD so obviously what we're looking at really at the moment is sort of like a, a mesh element density contour. Um, but really what we would like is um, some CAD services to um, either reanalyze again if you need to or take into CAD. So there's a few ways of doing that. So one of the first ones that you can see here is we have a fit polynerbs button. So these is just going to wrap polynerbs, so these sort of polynerb blocks, and it will fill the part with these. So these are all editable. Um, but you know, for more complex shapes, it's sometimes easier just to use this tool to automatically sort of wrap the shape for you. So if I just press fit polynerbs, you can see that it will take us to the polynerbs ribbon and it's created the fit for us. So we can right click and swipe out of that. It will exit the polynerbs tool and it will create a new part for us. So you can see here that if we hide off this optimized part, we're left with this series of polynerb cages put together that you can go ahead and just file export. What you may wish to do is obviously um, edit the polynerb cages such that they conform to the uh, fixings um, a little bit better than uh, what's shown at the moment. One thing again to immediately notice which could be of, of help is that you can see that two of the fixings are redundant so that's a really quick design change and, and way to reduce weight even further you can see that sort of these two either side aren't necessary um, based on this based on the minimized mass run so that's one way we can do it another way if I bring back the uh, mesh element sort of contour so the original design space is to manually wrap the shape so again I'll just briefly demonstrate how we can do that so if we go into the wrap tool and you can see here that what we can do is um, see sort of a, a visualization of what will be wrapped so depending on where the mouse is is how the wrap will appear so if I just click somewhere on this beam and move upwards so you can see that where I position my mouse sort of orientates that sort of wrap plane so obviously we can change the view as well and you can see here that if I move to this side it'll angle it one way and if I drop the mouse it'll angle it the other so we can just click and drag and we can drop a wrap around here it will want to continue or we can just click an empty space elsewhere and move somewhere else on the part obviously because we've put in a symmetry plane we can just focus on one side and then use the geometry mirror tool to fix the rest so let's say we'll create that one um, we'll focus around here maybe so we can just click and drag on that part click elsewhere to create somewhere new so again just clicking and dragging to create smaller sections just to make life a little bit easier for us and we'll do the same here and maybe have this uh, intersecting later on so we have a series of sort of disconnected shapes so what we can do for example is use the bridge tool let's say we'll go from this to this and now that's uh, put in a polynerve shape to bridge those together and we can even use the bridge tool to join this to this bottom face 
to join them up neatly like that. Another thing we can do, so if I come out of the bridge tool, is we can actually edit the polynerb cages themselves depending on what we're selecting. So if I click on just this face, for example, we can change the plane and the size of it. We can rotate around uh, uh, the central axis and we can even sort of click and drag to extend the shape. If we were to just click on uh, one of the lines, you can see that we have the option to move this line about so we can sort of um, stop this this plane from being perpendicular to the rest of the part and um, if we are to click on a, a, an edge as well we have the same controls for edges too so plenty of controls um, within the wrapping tool um, to end up creating sort of a, a neater version of the part so uh, there are plenty of videos we can have a look at using the wrap tool um, the advantage of wrapping manually is that you end up with less polynerb cages um, which makes life a little bit easier when you want to edit things later on. And so again, please feel free to continue um, wrapping and manually creating the polynerbs for your part. Um, it's pretty friendly to do. Um, more care will be needed when you get to the intersections of these parts, but you can then simply Boolean them together. So there's one method that you can um, employ when creating the polynerbs. Um, and now we'll have a look at um, another kind so we can actually um, using this part here we can shrink wrap everything together so if we go into the polymesh side of things so again for slightly more complex parts um, we can go ahead and use the shrink wrap tool so we'll go to shrink wrap parts we're just gonna click and drag everything actually in this case what we might do is um, come out of this tool and just hide these because those don't need to be included so all you need to do is click on the part and hide it or you can click on this icon here. So to the left of the part name, you can just click on the icon and it will hide it. So yeah, if we go to shrink wrap, we'll highlight everything and we'll press shrink wrap. So there is the wrap created. We can then, so right click and swipe out of that. And if we go to convert to triangle mesh here, we can then go ahead and smooth it. So we can see here that smoothing values will either make it more jagged so low smoothing or high smoothing so we'll leave it around there so once we've done this shrink wrap we can go back into polynerbs and we can actually fit uh, the shrink wrap tool so if we go to fit and that should leave us with a polynerbs fit based on that shrink wrap so something that looks a little bit like this so again this is another method of creating something close to what you'd like in CAD quite quickly as well. Um, there are plenty of controls within the polymesh side of things. So you should be able to press on the hamburger. At least so if we simply just go to the shrink wrap side and press this, you can choose a voxel size once you choose the part. And the same for fitting. So within fit, we have this where you can choose an element density and a break angle. So if you increase the element density, you'll have sort of fewer parts in there and the smaller element density, you can have more parts within the model. So there's a couple of ways in which you can go ahead, um, optimize a part and then take something back into CAD for you. So a couple of quick ways and um, really depending on sort of the complexity of the part. Um, so you can either use sort of the wrapping tool, the automatic polynerves fit or the shrink wrapping. It, it really depends sort of per use case. Um, but yeah, that, that's it for, for performing an analysis, um, having a look at the optimization and how that compares to your original design. I hope you can see that using the geometry editing tools, you can run through design iterations really, really quickly, or you can go ahead and uh, optimize the part as well based on that and see how all these values compare using the, the compare tool itself. And also another note is that Inspire has a host of manufacturing tools in sort of including casting and extrude. So if you want to make sure, oh, and including print 3D, which is even within here as well. So if you want to see how your part is going to perform when actually being manufactured, that's something that you consider as part of your generative design process. So thank you for watching this video. Um, and please enjoy using Altair Inspire for your own analysis and optimization. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, now we have the time for the questions and answers. So uh, please um, 
Can you explain a bit more about reliability? Uh, Marco, can you answer that question that uh, someone asked us you? Uh, this is about the uh, team that racing. So I think uh, this uh, switch uh, fine for you. Yeah, I'll answer that. Um, so basically reliability is a very important aspect of components in uh, especially former student because Reliability is basically making sure that the part that you're building and designing uh, does not fail during its use. And as we know, in former students, there's a lot of um, load cases coming in and affecting the, in this case, the uprights. Um, so we have, you know, vertical, lateral, longitudinal loads all acting on the wish on the uh, on the upright and what we want to do is make sure that that doesn't fail because as Connor showed, if one component of the upright fails, the whole kind of outboard suspension just fails and the car cannot um, run properly and do um, what is, you know, what it was built to do. So, you know, reliability is basically making sure that you're building something and making sure that whatever load cases uh, are occurring on it, the part does not fail does not, um, you know, break down. Uh, okay. Okay, great. The the rest of, of the questions has been uh, answered by by Jan, uh, my teammate. So thank you, Jan, for for all the questions and, and your answers. So now it's turn for uh, Pedro Salvadores. Uh, He's an aeronautical engineer and professor of applied physics and chemistry department at the University of Leon. Uh, he's also the technical director of the Racing Team University of Leon project, uh, where they develop uh, different racing cars for, for student competitions. And uh, he will talk about uh, Alger Inspire Studio uh, that uh, let designers and digital artists create uh, innovative designs faster while mixing uh, well, different modeling techniques with uh, really complex animations. So knowing that, uh, Pedro is going to show us uh, how they have used this solution to design their cars. And uh, after that, how um, you can use it uh, for creating a, a CAD design and then rendering the, the results. So uh, let's go, Pedro. Now it's your turn. Good morning, everybody from Spain. My name is Pedro Salvadores. I'm going to show our project. And at the beginning, first of all, I like to show our cars. And this is our second car. This car was developed to, to run to Silverstone in Formula Student. We, we couldn't go, we couldn't finish the manufacturing of this car due to the, the COVID uh, disease. This pandemic uh, already has stopped our activities almost at 70% 70, 70 more or less. But we are focusing during this uh, one year and a half in designing, in working very hard to develop. After this small presentation, I'm going to introduce uh, our cars, but uh, I will say on the field. On the field in this case is in, in using the Spire Studio software. First of all, I'm going to, to open the first cars I, I show you that is called energy. This car energy, you can see how we made it here using this software. I have to tell you that one of the amazing things that uh, we, we, we got experience using this software that uh, it works properly and very good with uh, uh, 
all computers for us who our computer is a computer with uh, between eight and nine years old that the kind of computer we use and we are developing all these cards in those computers we prefer to have uh, up-to-date computers but uh, we don't have uh, financial uh, power to, to get here you can see the car this is the car called energy and you can see now how we work it with the uh, software uh, studio and uh, with uh, this software we have developed all the parts of this car you can see here and even we can also, you know, move the parts and create new parts and so on. But one of the, the things that uh, I'm going to commend you because I will love a lot uh, is not only an engineering or design tool for us, Inspire Studio, but is our most powerful uh, marketing tool. Why is that? Why is that? Because uh, the software have uh, the, the most useful tool for us is the rendering. The rendering, of course, you know that let you render the cars of the the parts you you are building. But for us, the render, the fast render that uh, the software has, uh, let us to copy and paste in the different kind of documents, leaflets, and other documentation even to make posters with very good quality and very good, uh, uh, how to say, feel. We feel like we love this, this rough image. We love it. I use a lot this kind. It's not a perfect render, but uh, it's like this grain that he has. It's very nice for, for our marketing projects. You can see that the different options that we have, this kind of real-time render and this fast render is very useful. I'm not going to render any image here, any part, any, any card, because we'll take in this computer I'm using for this presentation about uh, 45 minutes. But at the beginning, at least I like to show you this capability because it's very useful for us. Anyway, you can see here how easy we work with uh, this kind of, uh, of tool and we use it mainly for the first design of the car. After that, uh, we uh, take the parts we want to analyze to the other alter software, SimSolid, uh, Spire, and so on, Wind Tunnel, to get uh, the information we need to finally manufacture, make the car. What is our main problem? To, to develop this kind of cars, our main problem always is to, to produce, to make the bodywork. The bodywork you can see is very difficult to get and so many parts. The, the, the only advantage, advantage that we have in our project is we have a lab, very, very good lab to make composite materials and we are working with carbon fiber and glass fiber, mainly glass fiber because for us it's, it's more safe uh, comparing with, com compared with uh, carbon fiber. And with this software, we can start to make the preview of how the mold will be. We use it to, to test it before. After that, after, of course, after uh, making all the simulations, we decide to start to, to produce, the to make the car. For us, the, the, the key point is to get the bodywork, as I said. This is the first car we have developed. And we started to develop this car with the, our uh, car called Galileo. I'm going to open this car. 
we started uh, at the same time the ener energy car and the Galileo car, but finally we we didn't have enough resources to to make both cars, and we decided to make the Galileo car because our idea is to get uh, one uh, car. Sorry, I apologize for my pronunciation. I'm not used to speaking English, so I'm trying to do my best. Here you can see our Galileo car, and this is our first car. It's hydraulic brakes, it's fulfilled with uh, a different kind of suspension and the steering wheel, but here in this model I'm going to present you is enough to see how is the, the car and we work, how we work with it. Here you can see, I'm going to send you especially this car our, this, in this presentation, this file render, because uh, we use it to put our stickers, the stickers of our sponsor or even the sticker of our university. That uh, tool I I will repeat many times here during this presentation. We love it because it's very fast and let us to to identify our cars, uh, let us to make marketing uh, through out our sponsors and so on. Well, the next car that uh, we have developed, I'm going to show you, is the car called H221K. This car, this car is uh, a new transformation, is a new evolution of uh, the energy car, but the only point of this car is uh, use a uh, fuel cell for hydro hydrogen fuel cell and electric motor as I said before. This car had new upgrades comparing, uh, compared with uh, our energy car related with the transmission system that we have uh, redesigned 100% of that uh, system. It's a little bit slow, sorry, here you have the car. This is the car with all the parts of the car developed. We have passed the car through the wind tunnel and the results are very, very good. We have to fix some parts in the, in the, in the, rear, the rear of aileron, uh, the rear aileron of the, of the car to get uh, more drag, but uh, the car is, uh, is the result, the simulation is, is very good. Here you can see it also how the fast render is working. After this presentation of the cars, I'm going to show you how we make the cars. I'm going to to present how the strategy and, we, and how we are making the cars in the with the Spire Studio software. You can see the quality is. Uh, I, I don't have words. Uh, for me, it's amazing. I have worked with other kind of software. Sometimes other people like other kind of engineering software. Is uh, you know. It's impossible to, to find uh, the perfect software, but uh, you try to, to design with the best software, and for me, this is the best, because the quality and the fast. One of the things that uh, make me use all the time Spire Studio is not only the fast render, it's my first comment, but is how fast I can design. Compared with other software, I, I, I made the, comp the, the, the comparison, I have compared. I can tell you that uh, 
the time I used to design the same part, if I use Inspire Studio, is about 30% of the time I need for other kind of software. For that, speaking about design, is so fast that it's worth it. Nothing compared. You can see this car, and I'm going to see you to show you uh, our last car that uh, we are working with is we call it Faraday is the evolution uh, as I said our car Galileo this car called Faraday uh, open it this car is an electric car two motors is battery battery power the battery is about uh, 50 volts and for us it's a very good car to introduce the student to the new technologies of the electrification of the, of the power unit of the cars and the use of the controllers and software to try to uh, develop the control units of the, of the cars. That's uh, the aim of uh, this car. It's going a little bit slowly, sorry for that, but uh, I hope that in, in a second we'll be here, here, we have, this is the car. Here you can see we have developed all the uh, damper, suspension system, the seat, the battery and here you can see all the transmission systems a very new one system and uh, this car also uh, i'm going to to hide you can see how the structure of the car I, I don't have any problem to show you the technology for us is in the spire studio parts that we use to, to after all, to manufacture the cars. I, I have to say that uh, our car Galileo uh, is the same bodywork that uh, I am showing. Uh, I am showing you here. We made it in Spire Studio. We export STL file. We send the STL file a company, a CNC with CNC machinery. We make the model and with the model we made the mold and with the mold we made in carbon fiber the the bodywork directly uh, from a studio to the cnc machinery well i'm going to to take the opportunity uh, i don't want to last too much uh, presenting the things that we do but uh, i like to show you the the set of the rear part of the transmission system of this car as an idea to uh, understand how we work with this software before to to make a demonstration you can see this is our transmission system and the engine that we have here and suspension uh, strut and so on the, the wheel the rim and even we use it the, this Im image is uh, what use it for us in, in sponsoring because the result is is very nice in this rough way in copy paste directly no need uh, no need to to get a very good render if we need we do it, but uh, it's faster and the quality and the image is very nice. Well, so after this presentation of uh, our project, I'm going to make a short demonstration of how we use the software. I don't know if we use the software properly because uh, we are learning uh, by using it. So, I'm going to make, from starting from the scratch, uh, 
the central part of the uh, bodywork of one of our cars. Uh, for making that, I have uh, uh, different drawings because uh, the strategy for, for making the car is not only to start uh, to draw here. It is not uh, as simple as to sit in front of the computer and starting to make lines, curves and so on. You need to prepare because you will have uh, many, many random variables you have to fix. For us to fix it, normal, normally, is to uh, make the profile of the car. So the profile of the car for us start normally, normally, we try to make a, a, a sketch and in this sketch is the beginning to build up the bodywork of the car or the, the base of the piece we want to make. First, we start always our first part we draw always is the wheel of the car. So, I choose to uh, draw the wheel of the car. The first question that I have, I like to, to put dimension of the wheel. Normalmente, normally, sorry, sometimes I mix Spanish. Normally, I can find that uh, when I open the software, is in the unit normally in centimeters. Uh, I prefer to work in millimeters, so uh, here in preferences, in units, I change at least the length unit to millimeters. Uh, when I finish in the part, I change all the units. Uh, always in density, I work with uh, grams, centimeters cubic, but uh, in this case, I think it's enough in millimeters. Our wheel is about 525 millimeters. With that, we have the first dimension of the our wheel. The, the next question that we have is the wheel base, the distance between the front and the rear wheels. Uh, in this car, that uh, is the H221K car, our hydrogen car, this wheelbase is 2500 millimeters. With that, we're making our first sketch. This is the beginning for us. It's the beginning because we prefer to... How to say it? This software has many... Uh, many options. You can use polynors, you can deform. Sometimes we use deform tools, the modified tools. We use a lot this kind. We use curves, we use surface, but to develop the, the bodywork, we prefer to use uh, polynomials. Polynomials let us to work very, very fast compared with other software. And when we apply offset and we apply thickness to that surface, we get very, very good quality surfaces that we use as we have the experience with our car Galileo to make uh, the, the model we need to produce to get the, the glass fiber bodywork. Well, I have here the first sketch and this sketch I'm going to create to create a, a small structure of a sketch one very important dimension for us is the distance between the uh, 
bottom of the bodywork uh, to the to the ground. For that, I'm going to fix the ground here. So uh, this is this is a construction construction line, and I'm going to define the the bottom of the car. I apply dimension. And I have now the bottom of the car. With this first dimension, I'm going to start to start drawing the profile of uh, of the car of the design. For instance, if I design that. Uh, The end of the card, the front end of the card, is a small circle of. Uh, I'm going to apply 100 millimeters, for instance. I'm going to to develop all the process. I think cancel. This unit is very small for this car, sorry. And I'm going to fix this kind of dimensions in this position. I'm going to use a tangent here. And I'm going creating the different kind of dimensions. For instance, this dimension, dimension here, I prefer that uh, could be interesting about 175 millimeters, and in this way, I have now the position of the of the of the bottom of the profile of the car using kind of carbs I'm going to to get one let's see some kind of carbs to get the the bottom of the profile I use the utility to to put constra uh, constraints Tangent constraint that was you can see it's a tangent constraint and the end tangent constraint I this I have this spare part I cut it and more or less I have a, a design this design. You have to put enough dimensions to, to adapt to your final design, okay? And finally, uh, I'm going to put the back of the seat of the car because I'm going to develop here uh, This part is the, the center part of the of the bodywork of the car of the cars and I decide that the distance could be for instance that the worst part of the design in my opinion you need you need to seventy-five millimeters for instance. This is the, the worst part of the design. It is very nice work with the software with you have all you have clear all the ideas you need about the design. But at the beginning you are starting with a blank page and sometimes it's very difficult to get a very nice result if you don't prepare uh, previously uh, your work, uh, your designing your designing work. Well I have uh, the back of the car here. I can use. I can I can move it. Uh, I have that part. 
And now I'm going to finish the rest of the part of the card. I'm going to draw a line. I don't worry too much sometimes uh, how if the dimension is okay. Just I draw. But I have a sketch uh, that sketch is my reference with the dimensions I think that could be the 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 ones that fulfill our requirements for making the car. The other point is this distance. This distance is very important because we, here we have the cop kit of the car and this dimension I'm going to fix it in about 800 for instance. Okay, I had a mistake. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to check. This one is not very good. I'm going to draw a line. Let's fix it. As I said, about 775. Hope that I don't have any problem now. I cut the spare parts I have here to clear everything. I almost I have cleared everything and the parts I don't need. At this point, we want to, for instance, we extend. I'm going to extend this card and I'm going to add. other carp here to get a very smooth design with uh, these lines I'm going to make it tangent and this one tangent here I have a problem with this part so I have uh, almost done. You can see that I, I can move the points to get, to get uh, the design I like. You can see that I, I can move the distance. This distance, the, the vertical distance of this line is not fixed. I'm going to fix. Normally for this distance we're using 445 millimeters okay this is very very small distance sorry I'm going to I'm going to increase it a little bit more to get one normal dimension of uh, 650 ah, yes that's right this could be uh, for me now a very good design that we are going to transform in polynomes when I finish all the sections I need. I'm going to cut here, cut, cut this part, and we have the definition of the first section section of uh, this project. That is sometimes for me is very important to avoid any mistake. Some part that I'm not going to to use as polynomes or as a base for a polynomes to put it in in construction form. It's very easy. Construction here. Construction. Okay. I have this part and I could work with with it. Well, made it this part. The second part I'm going to need is uh, the, per, the the square per uh, section and I'm going to make it. First, uh, I'm going to make a new sketch. This is sketch I dislike. I'm going to books close to it. 
finish the we already we already have uh, finished the first sections I need to make the the new one the second section to control what uh, we are doing to get the the finest or the nice the, the the more beautiful design but it doesn't mean that we have to simulate the behavior of this design speaking about uh, aerodynamics in the wind tunnel and so on in the other structural software and vibration and so on okay so we are now going to 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 get in the plane x y the new so i select the plane I'm going to get the new section. I'm going to look for, because the snap let me do it, I try to look for, to draw one line. I don't mind normally this kind, the, the, the dimension of the line I use as reference to center this plane and to move it and to put it in the middle of the part of the section of the main section of uh, this drawing. This is a reference line. I don't mind the position of the line, you can see, because now I have it, I, I can under I can start to draw the different parts that I'm going to need. The pick. Okay. Well, it's not going good. I have some mistake here. Okay, I have uh, this line. I'm going to make other line to check that everything is okay and the line is going in the right position okay it's perfect so I start to draw this section this could be a very good a very good position I'm going to add dimension Two hundred millimeters. I am using my hand sketch. I'm going to check that it's okay. It's okay. Okay. With this dimension, I need to fix it to avoid any movement of the lines. So, so to fix it, I put here in this position the mouse and I fixed at this moment I have uh, fixed this line I don't need any more this point I don't need any more this this line so I uh, start to draw the different dimensions of uh, this section I use this and I'm going to use new lines this is the, the rear part. Normally I using straight lines to make it in a very fast way, as you can see. So and I start to add different circles. I don't mind at the beginning how they are because I can add constraints. I'm going to start to add constraints, tangent constraints. I link the part 
start I cut the spare parts of the lines I'm going I continue adding constraints I cut the spare parts I'm going to put here a line small line because I don't need the rest of the circle this line is enough for me I'm going to make it construction line because I'm not going to use it almost as a reference I can have here this distance 245 could be good I have this position uh, this position this dimension could be Three hundred, three hundred seventy-five. Uh, I don't want it driven. Three hundred seventy-five. Okay, I have that this dimension, and I'm going to add some arcs to get a smooth transition. Cancel. I dislike it. I dislike this arc. I'm going to add the arc here in this point. I follow the same procedure as you can see. But you could see that this is very easy uh, and very fast how we resolve the different dimensions. Well, I add constraints tangent constraint tangent constraint tangent constraint so we already almost already we have uh, done this part we have to check how it's mixed here this line I don't need it I'm going to, in this point, to make a reference line, just for cut it. I don't know, it, uh, we will say it's more elegant, but for me it's very, very fast, and so I have, I have made the second section. With this, almost, I can draw the... Now, I um, I have made the second section. It's in the, in the other end. Of course, it's the beginning of the bodywork. And now, we can try to uh, prepare to make uh, the bodywork using polynorms. How we do it? Uh, it's very easy. We need to uh, transform or change these uh, reference lines into uh, lines that uh, could understand the, the polynor planes. So we use, for instance, the first profile. I'm going to work with it to use using the tool NARPS. I'm going to draw following the points using the snaps to have this line. Okay. It's made now. Almost is quite let's say it's quite Great. You can see I. You can see 
we can change if we want to if we want to to be more accurate we can change the degrees or even we can add new points and place it on the curve using the tool snap for me this line is okay so that's perfect i have the first one i need the second one is the, the other part of the sketch you can see it here i'm going to place other polyn polynar okay i'm going to resolve it then i'm going to move this one in this position i like this one here if i want more accuracy i'm going to add new points okay i have it i said it's okay now but uh, if you are working uh, alone or with your team could be easier and faster if you get a little bit more skill drawing uh, this kind of uh, of nerves as a reference lines i'm going to draw this one in the plane x y i using the same procedure i'm looking for the snap point i don't mind sometime if i'm very fast but i can change it here i finish it and i can change it here adding new points as i did in this way i am adding new points and i getting more accuracy okay so that's right i have a, a second line the problem is if i try to grab these three lines with the surface they don't know how it could be the the section that's the way we use this these tools we can use as many as we want normally we use seven or nine to to get a, 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 a smooth surface as the idea that we have for the for the bodywork and now i'm going to work with this nerve here i'm going to prepare and in this case is easier i don't need to to work with the this edge on these points i do it directly if i need some kind of uh, i my spe specification i need some kind for radius i don't mind i will have to draw the sketch and after done i usually work over the polynar as you can see and now I finished and we can add new points to get the surface that we want. For instance, I like a new point here, I like a new point here too. To be to get the surface much better. Okay, okay, I have it. I hide with the H key. I don't need it. I don't need this almost all sketch, and I need a new. I'm going fast, I don't mind, because as uh, I show, I, I have showed you, you can transform it 
adding new points with the new points you can get more or less a smooth, a smooth surfaces here okay that's right okay with uh, almost prepared this work I'm going to make the surface uh, I, I, I only you, you can see that uh, only I, I am I am made in the, the half I am making the half of the surface because uh, I have the tool symmetry to get the, the other half so I don't mind I'm going to hide all the sketch okay and uh, with all the skates height I'm going now to add or to create the surface using the polynomials. I use the polyplane I place a polyplane here sorry I drag and I get the polyplane one one question that we one question that always have uh, with the these polyplanes is is the the as you can see here the subdivision subdivisions subdivisions along the different axes so the length and the white axis I at the beginning I don't mind because uh, the division I worry about is the white because let me to get a smooth surface you can see how it is divided subdivision so along L in this case do you, I have two profiles I only want to need I only going to need one subdivision so along L you can see why ok I finish the plane and you can see I, I have different uh, forms I can see this polyplane I can see it as a base through ver vertices to through, through edges or through uh, faces I need the points here so how we work with the points with the, these points uh, of course I I put here the control panel I prefer it I'm more comfortable I select all the points selected all the points I said that uh, I want to align to a card I'm going to align all these points with this profile so I select the card and you can see in an automatic way is place it here so it's absolutely great okay I have it and but now I need to do the same with the other uh, part of the polyplane I select align to the curve and here I have the surface this surface you can see it has uh, it's a little bit strained, it's not adapted to the other profiles. I'm going to show you the surface in another way. Uh, if I press the key number two, or here, the different way I can, I can say the, the surface is not adapted with the other part of the profiles that we have. How we can resolve it? It's very easy to resolve it. I need more points and that means that I'm going to need more profiles but you I need to adjust this surface to the different sections I'm going to put over here okay it's very nice this surface but uh, if I press the, the key N I get a smooth surface or here in Nullify. If 
if I want to see a small render of the surface, I press interactive render, it's the fast render, I choose the material, I like a lot the orange color, I choose it, and you can see we have, if we hide the different references lines I have made, you can see that uh, this very nice surface that we have brought. If we apply here, if we apply here, I'm going to situation 2, one without rendering any part, uh, I come here, with modify, in modify I have symmetry, I apply for the object, I have here the symmetry of uh, my bodywork that I have here. If I make a very fast render, I can see that I have this bodywork. So, thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Pedro. It's really interesting to to see how fast uh, you can create a, a new design thanks to to the intuitive interface that uh, then uh, alter inspire studio offers and i'm really happy to to see everything you you do to to develop the whole uh, chassis for for your racing cars uh, now as uh, we did before it's time for for the q and i so as we did before um we have been answering all your questions in the question chat, but Pedro, I would like to to ask you something. You have shown uh, us how to, you have developed your your racing cars chassis, and I wonder how many cars you have designed with Inspire Studio, and you have designed all the parts and assemblies with it. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for letting me make this presentation. Um, and I apologize for my pronunciation, but uh, that's how I pronounce the English. So I, I, I like to make me understand enough. I have to tell you that we develop almost our cars using Spire Studio. At the beginning, we try other softwares, but uh, the other softwares uh, to try to get enough knowledge skill for our uh, students, we have a learning curve very long for us. So uh, our project is uh, three years old, so we need to, to work fast. So when I discovered Spire Studio, at the beginning I have to change my mind how to, to design new parts. And when we made up how to work with with this software we use uh, for everything of course it's not perfect but i i see that alter is improving a lot very fast but for us is the best one we're working actually with seven cars uh, our line of develop the cars is uh, we have the the limit of the of the budget that we have we for us we live in, in uh how to say it a low industrial area of uh, Spain, and we can get we cannot get to industrial companies to support our activities. So we started to work with uh, the bodywork, with uh, a lab that we have created, with uh, to work with uh, different kind of composite materials, and uh, our project is uh, full oriented to develop the chassis and the transmission and the powertrain of our cars. So we started with the small cars and we build it. And we build up the, the small car that you saw, as uh, you saw part of the, in the video that we presented on TV. And the people like a lot and like a lot, of course, the, the final quality of our work. So with that skill that we have now, we started uh, one year and a half to develop, to develop uh, Formula student cars, but uh, our cars are a little bit longer than the standard Formula Student cars. 
because we love the Formula One, so we try to get almost one kind of those cars. We are working actually with uh, one car of gasoline, we are working with an uh, electric car, and we are working with a uh, hydrogen car uh, that use the energy of uh, fuel, fuel cell, and with, of course, an um, electric car motor. And for, for us, I don't know if I, I, I am speaking too much, but I have to tell you that uh, uh, it's needed for, for the design of the, of, the, of the chassis, of the bodywork, to work uh, or to design working linked our, your design with a uh, wind tunnel software. The wind tunnel let us to start iteration and we try our first design. We go to wind tunnel, we check if it is okay, and we create a new version. Uh, in our experience these uh, few years, never at the first time we get the final or the best design. We need at least two or three iterations. I don't know if I have answered the question, but anyway, sure. you yeah. question, please don't doubt to ask me or contact contact me by email. Okay, thank you, Pedro, for for your answer. So uh, now it's time for our last uh, presentation. So um, it's going to be done by uh, Rafael Silva, a mechanical engineer that works at Alter uh, Brazil since uh, May 2017 as a technical documentation engineer for, for Alter SimLab and who is currently working as a development specialist and as a member of the global technical team with uh, Alter SimLab. So uh, he's going to, to show us uh, this solution for, for simulating physics uh, phenomena because uh, Alter SimLab includes uh, structural, thermal, electromagnetics and fluid dynamics solvers, which allows us to, to analyze different problems with, with high efficiency and highly automatic uh, thanks to, to, to the templates that, that you can create. And as you will see, it also has an intuitive interface that makes it easier to, to learn and, and use. So uh, let's go with uh, the, the introduction of uh, Alter SimLab. Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you. Let's proceed with the Outer Student Webinar Series, getting into Outer SimLab. My name is Rafael Silva, and I'll be the panelist for this session. When we talk about SimLab, we're talking about an environment where you can go from the creation of your finite element models until analyzing the performance of really complex assemblies, such as this suspension system right here, uh, where you can run multiple physics, including structural, thermal, electromagnetics, and fluid dynamics, which can be easily set up using highly automated modeling tasks. So just talking about these three examples right here, I have my suspension system, most of my parts included here, and I want to verify what is the response of the system to specific loads that is being applied? So I have here, let's say my upright, my brake disc, and my brake caliper, my wishbones also. And I want to add some inputs such as the braking force or the cornering force or my bump force and verify the response to all this loading. What is the displacement of the system? What is the deformation and the stresses caused by those loads? In terms of a uh, physical problem, uh, this can be understandable using mathematical models to define those physical problems that I want to understand. And to uh, solve my mathematical equations of my mathematical model, finite element methods is one of the, the, the methods that you can use to uh, really make it easy to calculate all those equations that is being taken into account. Uh, on those assemblies or complex models that you're trying to simulate. In my top uh, image right here, I'm trying to understand the temperature distribution whenever I add. Uh, I have my printed circuit board right here with the, all the components and they have some uh, heat uh, dissipation and also heat generation 
uh, loads which I want to add to my uh, my assembly to verify what is the temperature distribution throughout all my components. All right, so talking about uh, the finite element method, the first thing that comes into my mind is how to define precisely a finite element model. And for that, we begin with the system idealization, which is simply going from your physical problem as the suspension system that we had in previous slide. Uh, and with that physical problem, we want to build a mathematical model to represent the behavior of that physical problem. Uh, to build that mathematical model, we need to add some hypotheses to it, such as what is the geometry, what are the material laws, what are the loads and the kinematics. After you've built your mathematical model, then you can solve it. And one of the ways to solve a mathematical equation or a mathematical model is using the finite element method in which you will uh, reduce the, the problem complexity uh, from a continuous uh, geometry to really discrete geometry such as tetrahedron or hexahedron elements, which are the names that we give to those uh, really tiny pieces of uh, discrete uh, geometries that we find in the finite element approach. Then we have the mesh density specification, which is simply the mesh size. Then we can define our solution and the parameters involved in the uh, simulation or calculation that we want to, to do. And for that, we can represent our loads and boundary conditions. Exemplifying here a structural analysis where we've talked about the suspension system. Uh, we have our physical problem, which is mainly my suspension system is, uh, I want to evaluate the response uh, due to some inputs such as the cornering or the braking force. And this will be my physical problem. Uh, and for that, I can build a mathematical model as an exemplification here, Newton's law, where it takes into account the acceleration, the velocity, and the displacement. This uh, equals to a force that varies along the time. And first things that we want to do as a system idealization is ask a few questions, uh, whether I want to solve this problem as a linear or nonlinear, whether I want to solve it as static or dynamic, and also having consistent unit system, system throughout your whole workflow. So we have a geometry that is imported uh, in millimeters, let's say. I need my material loss, my, I need my loads, I need my initial conditions all to be within this same unit system so that my result at the end will be consistent. All right, so we have this physical problem right here, a really complex one to solve. But in the finite element methods, as I mentioned, we want to reduce this complexity by representing all these parts, all these tiny parts, such as the, the beams right here, with specific elements, such as a 1D representation or shell elements or solid elements. And one thing that you need to ask yourself is, what type of elements should I use? to represent it precisely, uh, this problem. The first thing that you need to understand is what are the outputs that you want uh, to get out of this uh, simulation? If it's simply a displacement, then 1D element representation will be just fine for you. Answering some of the questions that I've asked in the system idealization part, uh, how to define my problem in terms of if it's linear or nonlinear, if it's static or dynamics. Let's go into it right now, comparing both of them and understanding uh, where and when should you use linear or nonlinear, static or dynamic. So starting with the linear part, our fundamental condition is that the stiffness matrix remains constant along the analysis. And that means that we have proportionality between causes and effects. Uh, this stays as a constant value whenever I take, for example, my force divided by my, my displacement. This will remain constant throughout my whole analysis. Uh, on the other hand, my nonlinear, this is really a good example of a nonlinear problem. We have all these three nonlinearity sources 
displayed right here. So the nonlinear fundamental condition is that the stiffness matrix will vary along the analysis comparing to not varying. And there are three sources of nonlinearity, which is material, whenever your material is exiting the linear behavior and starting with the plastic behavior, uh, it will cause nonlinearities and changes in the stiffness. Geometric nonlinearities, which is uh, whenever you have large displacement, the stiffness will also change because you're changing the shape, let's say, uh, of, your, of your body, such as, as this example right here, the stiffness is getting higher and higher whenever I press this down. And also contact nonlinearities, which is uh, you can deal with friction uh, coefficient. You have this sliding contact that has some friction on it. This represents nonlinearities. And also whenever you're dealing with an open gap, what I, uh, what I mean about that is you have two components which they don't touch each other, nor vir virtually, nor physically. And when you start pushing one to another, it will get into contact between each other and this will increase the stiffness of your system. And this is also one of the causes of nonlinearities. The other question is if it's static or dynamic, and mainly whenever we're dealing with static, our first hypothesis is that the, the mass or the inertia effect uh, does not take into account our simulation, so it's neglected. Also, our velocity times the coefficient, the damping coefficient. So basically, we have our force equals to our displacement times our stiffness. The dynamic event, uh, in other hand, the inertia effects are really important. Uh, we have this uh, weight distribution and weight transfer during the, the simulation process. And the time period also affects the results. So we have our full Newton laws equation right here. As we can see here in this example, this is something that needs to be dynamic because I have this weight distribution going from the back to the front uh, after the impact. And I also have at certain time frames, uh, some time steps, uh, specific values for stress and displacement and deformations, all that included. So we can see here at time zero, we have no deformation at all, but once it reaches zero, 0 0.12, let's say, the final time right here, we have the maximum deformation. Now going through some engineering applications, I have one here to show you right before we do some demo using SimLab. Uh, we have this belt sander, which is mainly used to smooth the, the wood. Uh, and this is a really complex problem. We have a lot of parts involved in this. We have the interior of it, which is, uh, we have some electronics. We have a, a, an electric motor also. And in the outside, we have this cover made of plastic. So simulating that uh, is really uh, complex. And we have the result right here that I wanted to show. Uh, the complexity of the things that we can do in terms of simulation. So the, the, the outer case, which is made of plastic, we can simulate basically the injection mode of it, adding the fluid and see how it is uh, acting the filling time, uh, the cooling time, uh, and the temperature distribution after a certain period of time. With that temperature distribution, we can add some constraints to evaluate the warpage. So the flexions to the uh, to your component just based on that temperature distribution that resulted from your injection molding simulation. We can do a nonlinear event such as this three point bending, evaluating the stresses and deformations due to a, a bending test. We can analyze also the, the fluid dynamics internally. So we have this electric motor. Uh, with a certain rotation, and we can evaluate the temperature distribution due to that flow that is caused by that rotation internally. We can also evaluate the durability and resistance uh, to drop tests, so to drop impacts. Uh, we're dropping this component from a certain height, and we want to evaluate the stresses and deformations uh, in case we have plastic deformations, and also the, the package inside. Uh, how all the components is resistant to that uh, specific load that we're applying right here. So 
all these can be uh, used to design a single piece. In my case here, I'm designing just the exterior piece. I'm just simulating the the outer casing, which is made of plastic. And as you can see here, uh, the complexity involved in simulating these kinds of components it's immense, and we can use and uh, the finite element methods to really reduce that complexity in terms of equation calculation. Going into SimLab, let's see how this workload that we've talked about in terms of uh, physics problem, mathematical model, and FEA uh, workflow goes into this software right here. In our demonstration, I'm going to use this simple model. It's not even an assembly, but for the, the purpose, uh, it will be enough. In my case here, I'm going to do a linear static event and also heat transfer. And then I'm going to overlay the temperature results from my heat transfer to my linear statics. Okay, uh, this is similar for those who haven't seen it before. It's really a user-friendly interface. We have some icons here representing all the tools that we can use. Uh, for each of the menus, the tools and the icons will change accordingly. And going from each of those, let me just comment a little bit about it. The solutions tab is where we will see all the physics and applications that we can solve. Structural thermal flow electromagnetics, I've talked about them, but we can also do some other applications such as drop test, fatigue, even DOE and optimization. In the sketch menu, we have how we can create our own geometry, starting from sketch uh, and extruding that or doing some revolution to get the solid body. Then we have our geometry menu, which includes creating geometry, primitive geometries and editing those also editing capabilities uh, by importing your CAD, so we can do some editing with this menu right here. Then we have the mesh menu where we can go from the 1D, 2D to the 3D mesh, adding some mesh controls to it in order to specify the mesh size on a specific region or even the, the mesh flow from a region to another, the transition between these mesh sizes that may differ from each other. Then we have the analysis menu, is where we can add the loads and constraints, initial conditions, contacts, connectors, all that will be stored right here. Then we have the results, so once you have solved your problem, we have here some tools that we can use in order to post-process those results, such as creating XY plots, defining and finding hotspots, and also frequency response. All right, so let's start with importing our CAD. I'm getting my T-Port uh, example imported right now. And here on my left wing, I have my model browser. Right now I'm in the assembly tree, so all these tabs is within the model browser. The assembly trees where all the bodies and components that you have will be stored, not only CAD, but also the mesh models as well. So once we mesh this component, you will be able to see that there will be stored both the CAD and the mesh bodies. All right, uh, as the first thing that I will do for meshing purposes is measuring this. I'm going to get just the bounding box for me to get have some reference in terms of and mesh size that I should define. And then I will check on this length right here. We'll check the length. So this is 4.1. Okay. The unit I haven't enabled, but I have imported this model as millimeter. So all you've seen, this value right here will be in millimeter. But you could also enable the unit system to work with a visible one. All right, uh, let's go into the meshing process then. Uh, we could do a really straightforward Tetra mesh onto this, but I'm gonna do some mesh controls uh, because I want to define more than one layer to my uh, thickness right here. So the first thing that I will do is add in a body mesh control. This will ensure that my average element size within this component is 
predefined. In my case, I'm going to define six millimeters. And as have you seen, uh, the length right here for this uh, edge is 4.1. So if I add six millimeters, this will make that uh, this thickness will only have one element. And for that reason, I'm going to specify a number of tetra elements, layers that I want to have. Instead of one, I want to have two layers uh, to define this thickness. The reason I'm doing that is because I want to increase the, the precision of my model uh, and the more refined uh, the more refined the mesh it is, the more precise it can be. There are some exceptions whenever you're dealing with uh, uh, some errors that may happen, but in terms of rules, whenever you mesh it, you'll get a more precise result until you reach a certain convergence. For, for them. All right, so I have defined both mesh controls, body and a volume layer, which ensures that I have two layers right here. Now I'm gonna do a simple Tetra mesh, just opening this panel, hitting okay. And now my, my software is creating the mesh in the background so I can see here the, the progress bar. Let's wait a little bit, just a few seconds for it to finish. Uh, then we can check the the elements inside and exterior elements as well. Okay, so we have our initial mesh. This will be enough for us in terms of precision. There's a few things that I will recommend. Increasing the number of elements within the fillets where you might have stress hotspots also in this other uh, end right here. So these are typical points where you will see stress uh, hotspots, you will see a, a higher stress in this region due to stress concentration factors that you have in the geometry. In my case, I'm going to leave it as it is for this pub, for the demonstration purpose. Uh, so now we have both models. We have our CAD and we have our finite element model. With that, we can proceed to the solution setup. In my case, I'm going to start with the linear static one. I will select the body that I want to use. And I can see here that my, my model browser has changed to the solution tab. This is where all the inputs, such as loads and constraints, such as contacts, such as coordinate system, all this will be stored right here in the solution browser. So let's start with a simple basic problem, which is uh, a hydrostatic pressure due to the T that is inside this teapot. So let's add that uh, fluid as a hydrostatic pressure. In my case here, I have my density of fluid in millimeter, uh, in kilogram millimeter cube, and we have my gravity in millimeter second square, per second square. The, the selected faces that is needed to, uh, as input is the faces that uh, we call wet faces. So we have these faces right here, which is in contact with the fluid. Uh, and then I'm going to define the fluid level so that we have a specific height of fluid inside of it. In my case, I'm going to use the XZ plane as reference and give a certain uh, distance to it. So now we can see this plane, everything below that will be covered in fluid. So this is all uh, that I need for my pressure input right now. Graphically, this, there is no representation of the fluid, uh, at least using hydrostatic pressure, but I can see here the load that has been created representing that. All right. After that, I can add my constraints. Uh, I will simulate right here somebody holding this, uh, this handle uh, using these nodes as reference. So a person is grabbing this teapot uh, in this section right here. I'm constraining the degrees of freedom uh, that previously had this pot. So that's all basically that we need in terms of loads and constraints to simulate uh, my teapot example right here. In terms, we 
in case we have multiple bodies, we could deal with contact. So we could add contact between both pods. And we could add uh, another types of loads that we could use, such as bearing pressure or temperature. But in my case right here, we're going to stick to a simple hydrostatic pressure being applied due to the fluid inside of the teapot and my node constraint simulating somebody grabbing it by the handle. After that, uh, we should define what is the material that is made this teapot of. In my case, it's porcelain. So I have it stored right here on a file, an exterior file. I can right click to verify what are the mechanical properties. So we can check here the density, Young's module Poisson ratio, and we can also check our stress limits. So for tension is 15 megapascal, for compression 240, and for shear stress we have 30 megapascal. I'm gonna select my body to apply that material and hit OK. Uh, that's all I need since we're running a linear static uh, problem. We just need the the stiffness itself and uh, the loads to calculate the displacement. So from our previous equation, force equals stiffness times displacement. <clears throat> we have the force represented as the pressure. And we also have the stiffness, which is taken into, into account based on the material that we have uh, selected right here. With that said, we can simply run by clicking on update and the solver will start running in the background and in a few seconds we will be able to see the results and evaluate them afterwards. Okay, so we've got our results. Uh, with our initial results we can see that the maximum stresses are around our, our are close to our constraints, so we can check here show main max. Uh, we can see that the max uh, stress is located at this node right here. Let me just show you the node. So at this node right here, the central node, uh, it's where we can see our max stress value in this case. We can also evaluate the displacement and the energy error density. Uh, and the minimum is around the other end, so we have this minimum at this side right here. One thing that you should consider whenever you're evaluating the result is if this value here is relevant for you and the location where the stress is, is at. In my case, since this is close, my constraint is not really where I want to evaluate in terms of uh, stress. What I want to evaluate right now is where my stress concentration factors is present. So verifying the results in this region, we can check that the, the maximum stress value is around 0 0.9 megapascal and comparing to the our limits that we have in our material. For the tension stress, we have 15 megapascal. So this maximum that we have uh, calculated after the simulation is really low comparing to that, which will result uh, in a high factor of safety something that we might not even need for this design, this amount of factor of safety. So in order to decrease this factor of safety, let's say a factor of safety of four, we should consider changing the, the thickness of this model or changing geometric. This is our first consideration. We just evaluated this as a linear static problem, but what if this is not the consideration that we should took? Is this a correct approach we should uh, we should take in order to, to design this teapot. In, in many cases, uh, this question is really hard to answer because uh, it takes into account the, the analyst experience. And uh, in my case right here, I'm gonna just try a different approach. Instead of just using a linear static problem, I'm gonna add some heat to this teapot to evaluate what will be the, the results whenever I apply some, some temperature on the bottom side of this teapot and see how the stresses behave whenever I do this heating procedure. Now what I want to do is go into the thermal pod and do a steady state heat transfer solution. I'm selecting once again my teapot. And now as you can see in my analysis ribbon, all the relevant icons has changed. 
in accordance to my solution that I have specified. In my case, thermal, all relevant tools will be added to, to do a thermal analysis. As loads and boundary conditions for the thermal solution, what we're going to add is uh, a fixed temperature of 300 degrees on the bottom side, simulating that we're heating with the cooktop, let's say. And we also will add the convection due to the air and also due to the fluid internally. So let's go into it. Let's add initially the temperature. Let's select our bottom face, which is the face that has been heated. A constant value of 300 degrees Celsius. And then we're gonna add the convection from the air. So we have our temperature 20 degrees Celsius with the film coefficient 0.01. Let's select the outer faces right now. Apply. And I'm gonna add a 90 degrees Celsius convection. Uh, that is my body in contact with the fluid inside of it. So my T heated at 90 degrees Celsius. So this is my T temperature right now. So I'm adding also that convection due to that fluid. All right, that's all we need in terms of thermal steady state heat transfer. We have added the temperature as a constraint, let's say, a temperature constraint, and we have added the convection as my loading, let's say. Now we can add uh, update, and we can calculate the temperature distribution uh, throughout our entire body. All right, we've got here the results, as we can see at the bottom side, with the red color represents the high temperature, and the blue color a lower temperature. Uh, at the bottom, at 300 degrees, which was the, the predefined value for the temperature at the bottom part, and then we have this temperature distribution due to the cooling process of the convection. So we have an air film covering the outer side and the fluid film covering the inner side. And this is pretty much what we get out of the steady state heat transfer in this case right here. We can then check, for example, the temperature at the handle. So we can check that the value right here is around 30 degrees, which is acceptable to someone to hold it. We've got our thermal distribution, but this doesn't, doesn't show us anything about the stresses. It's just the temperature, the grid temperature around my component. So the thing that I need to do right now is get back to my structural simulation. Let's, let's set it as current. So I'm getting back to my structural simulation. And now what I'll be doing is include my temperature result and my loads and constraints right here. And to do that, I can simply include the temperature from that specific uh, load case that I did. In my case, the solution thermal. Okay, now we can see uh, this marker right here representing the temperature distribution. We can check also the, the contour of it. So it's equivalent to what we had uh, in the, the thermal analysis. And now we can simply run it and verify what will be the stresses uh, based on the hydrostatic pressure that we have applied and also the mapped temperature from our thermal case. All right, now we've seen some changes around the value. And what we can take out of that is that from 0 0.9 megapascal by adding a different, a different consideration to our problem, which was adding a heat source on the bottom side, we now see that the stresses uh, are higher than our uh, allowed stress from our material that we've seen. So 15 megapascal for the stress, uh, the tension stress. We can see that this value is higher than it. So in that case, our body uh, wouldn't, let's say, survive to that specific uh, loading. This way, the, the porcelain will break apart and uh, it won't resist to this heating source at 300 degrees Celsius. So all that was just to, to tell you that whenever you're uh, trying to represent 
something from nature as a physical problem, uh, be aware that many things can take can be taken into account in that uh, problem definition. Because a simple thing that I did, just adding a different application to this problem, which was uh, heating up my, my teapot, made my problem go from a safety factor of more than 10 to something that wouldn't resist. We've talked about only these three blocks right here on the top part. But after our final element solution, we need to verify the solution accuracy and results, uh, interpret those results. Uh, in case we feel there are more things to be added in that solution, we need to refine our analysis. And two ways of doing that is improving the model, the mathematical model, or even modifying our physical problem itself. So this is what we did in our case. We modified our physical problem and therefore we received uh, different results due to that. And this is something that you also need to take into account whenever you're doing this system idealization stuff. So that's it that I wanted to show you in this presentation, covering uh, really the fundamental process about finite element method, how to uh, define a problem, how to create the mathematical model out of it, and uh, calculate using finite element method, uh, and also showing that how it is the workflow inside SAMLAB, how can we done, how can we do uh, create the mesh, uh, apply the material, define the solution, uh, set up all that solution, adding loads of constraints, and verifying the result and interpreting that result. Thank you for your attention, and in case you have any questions, I'll be here to answer you as panelists. Thank you very much, and have a good day. So thank you so much for, for your demo, Rafael. Uh, now it's time again for, for the Q&A. So uh, we're going to to read some of the, the questions that you've made and uh, Rafael will, will answer them for sure. So the first one is uh, what type of problems are better suited for more mess control in, in general? Uh, yeah, so for that question, it may vary uh, depending on what application you're trying to do, structural, CFD, uh, they vary a lot based on those. For structural, mainly whatever, uh, whenever you have more refined mesh, you will also have, and most of the times, you will have a more precise results as well until you reach a certain plateau or a certain convergence just in case you have numerical singularity, which is one of the errors that you may find within the method, then you won't get a better result when refining it more. But uh, it depends. Even in structural, uh, sometimes you have a single element representing a bin, and you just want the displacement, and this single element will get you the result, the, the, more, the most accurate result as possible, just the, the same value as the numerical calculation to it. So it depends a lot. In CFD, for example, you may need a lot of boundary layers uh, to represent those uh, the interface. Uh, so it's, it's basically whenever you're trying to just being short, uh, it depends very much on the, the application that you're trying to do. And it depends based on the standards of the company that you will be working with or the, the project that you'll be working with. So it varies. Okay, great. And uh, the next question is uh, if we can do a fluid simulation in Algebra yeah. Simlab. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in Simlab, we are a multi -plat uh, multi physics platform, as I mentioned. Uh, we can deal with finite element uh, method to create also the CFD mesh, and we can also do volume uh, elements in terms of. Uh, E-flow. So, in case you are dealing with uh, electronic system design and you want to calculate the the flow and add those uh, just the the force convection itself based on uh, Navier-Stokes equations, then you can do uh, volume elements. But 
uh, in general, we do finite element method for both of those uh, using AccuSolve as our soft uh, solver. Uh, for Fluid, we can also do SPH, which is creating particles to simulate, uh, let's say, fluid behaviors internal. Uh, uh, an example will be gearbox uh, fluid uh, simulation, and we can do uh, using particles as well. So all three approaches uh, we can do inside SEMLAB. Okay, great. And uh, can you simulate a dynamic setup when friction induces thermal energy? Let me get to that question, sorry. Can you simulate a dynamic setup where friction induces thermal energy? We can simulate a dynamic nonlinear event. Uh, I haven't tried using that kind of approach using friction induced thermal energy, but for sure you can apply, let's say, sliding contact with some friction and, uh, attached to it and also get the, the, the temperature mapped out of it. So you can do dynamic nonlinear events also in, in SEMLA. Okay, and the last question is, is it possible to use SimLab for CFD simulation? For example, aerodynamic parts in a race car? Yeah, for outer, outer CFD runs, let's say we use ultra fluid X uh, coupled. Uh, in SimLab, we normally use only nano fluid X with H4 internal CFD simulation using particle approach. So, you might get better results from other preprocessor than SimLab in terms of aerodynamic and so. But still, we 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 can do some aerodynamic just using the the elements that we have, so the finite element analysis. Okay, great. So there's no more questions. If you have uh, any other question, you still have time to, to ask it. And thank you so much uh, for all of you to, to join in this session. And I hope you enjoyed them and learn how to use uh, all of these programs. So uh, I'm sure uh, these presentations will help you uh, in your future projects, uh, not only in your final thesis or for your degrees or your masters, but also in your liberal future when, when you join different engineering companies. So thanks again and have a nice day. And thanks again for joining. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.